Well, we're back. It's Think Tech. It's it Community Matters. is Professor Charles Booth, a professor of law at the UH uh, Law School. That's the William S. Richardson Law School, who I have known, help me on this, Charlie, who I have known since 2003 or four, like that, something like Long that. Long time. Yeah. And you've been all over the world and you've studied insolvency and comparative insolvency and systems in various countries mm-hmm. in Asia through what, the 2008 Asian crisis and, and since then. And um, you travel mm-hmm. around a lot. In fact, you join us from um, Michigan. You know, so somebody's got to be in Michigan. Good to be here. Good to see you again. The <laughs> same. So let's well, catch up. This morning it was in the 30s. <laughs> I'm sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let's catch up. You're, you're going to be uh, on a webinar by uh, the Scheidel School um, on uh, for, with PAMI, the Pacific Asian Management Institute, uh, Shirley Daniel, and mm-hmm. this Friday um, at um, uh, let's see, it's going to be ten o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, if anybody wants to sign up for that, you're there with three other academicians uh, to talk about uh, U.S. Uh, China relations. Mm-hmm. Um, is is it a a, a duet or a duel, or a duel or a duet. Uh, very interesting question. And, and um, um, they can sign up if they want on our website, which is thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, Charlie, I, I'm so interested in your perspective of how things have been going. Because if you look at it from a, an economics point of view, if you look at it from a historical point of view, um, the question of insolvency laws and the nature of insolvency conceptually in the law and in the fact uh, is a barometer. It's a canary in the coal mine. It tells us about, uh, you know, the world economy, maybe where world business, world welfare is going. Um, so can you talk about how it's changed, for example, in Asia as you make your comparisons since 2008? Absolutely, Jay. I'd be glad to. Um, insolvency has been my, my window to the world, uh, so to speak. Um, I've been studying Asian insolvency law since the 1980s. I, I think I might have been one of, if not the first American to, uh, to do so. So I've been following it for a, for a very long period of time. Um, I, I think when I was on your show one time, the quote I used when I met with a Chinese academic back in the 80s is, is he put it to me that insolvency was the medicine, but there was no illness. This was back in the 80s. So they did not need the insolvency law. <laughs> now we fast forward to the present. And yeah. really for the last uh, 20 years, really since the Asian financial crisis, Asian countries have been in the process of trying to improve their insolvency laws and moving from systems that just liquidated assets of companies and basically distributed just cents on the dollar to systems that allowed reorganization allowed saving companies and increasingly helped individuals. One so of those- why, why is that better? Why is that more enlightened to have a chapter 11 reorganization possibility uh, instead of just liquidate and then uh, pay the owners and, and get out of town? Well, that, that's a good question. That's a very good question. And traditionally, most systems just were liquidation. It's much easier. You gather the assets together, you sort it out, you divide it up, and then you remit uh, payment to the various creditors. Um, that will work better in a country like the U.S., where you have a very good uh, unemployment system. So workers will be able to get some money because they won't get enough money from the company. Um, it won't work very well in countries without a safety net, where they're going to get very little, if anything, if anything uh, at all. Um, another problem, and, and this was a, a problem that China confronted, is that when you have state-owned enterprises that are huge and hire hundreds of thousands of, of, of people, um, if they're all unemployed, um, that could very well lead to social unrest. Um, so that the Chinese uh, really for the last uh, 20 years were formulating uh, a law and that law came into uh, effect uh, about uh, 13 years ago. And that law is trying to save companies because they're trying to save jobs. They don't want people to be, be unemployed during times of, of, of crisis. And even right now during the current pandemic, um, that's the position that China has taken. Um, Unlike the states where a lot of companies have fired people or furloughed people, in China, the government policy is for um, companies not to let people go, and if anything, um, to actually increase hiring. Um, so just recently, you know, the big Chinese banks are doing a lot of hiring, and I read one article that one of the banks 
uh, they say, has hired more recent graduates than all the major U.S. and European banks together. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because it, it, China, with all its, and we can talk about all its problems, uh, that all seems more humane to me and, um, you know, enlightened, if you will. And, and then in Europe, the same thing. Europe is not quite the same, but it's more like humane than, it, than the United States. The United States is stuck in some 19th century concept, isn't it? We, we don't really care what happens that much to the employees. Um, oh, and I, we don't, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, go ahead. D- disagree violently. It's okay. You yeah, know, and I think I'd I'd um, I'd state that a little differently. In that, I think in the states, because of the social safety net, um, you're not expecting to get as much money from the entity itself. So even if you look back to the Great Recession, uh, basically companies let workers go, but the government let unemployment benefits run for a long period of time. And recently, until we had the stalemate in, in Congress, the same thing this time. There were big payments going to to workers. So I think the insolvency system works better if you're not looking to the insolvency system to make payments to workers, large payments to workers, because the difficulty is if that is the case, then there's not money for other creditors. And systems where workers do very, very well in insolvencies mean that creditors like banks do not, and then the banks are gonna be reluctant to lend to companies if they have a lower priority. Um, So so just recently I helped um, work on, with, with the World Bank, a new law for Laos, for the Lao PDR, and there, the, the banks do have a lower priority than, than workers. And that, that is one of the factors that we discussed with them from, in, in terms of the, the implications that that has for, um, for lending um, in that country. How does that work? I mean, how has it worked over your career? Which is, of course, involved a lot of teaching and a lot of writing, but I imagine, so you'll get a, a call from some government official in Laos, for example, and say, uh, you know, can you help us out? Because we don't think this is working quite right. And we want to know what your suggestions are. And maybe you should draft some statutes for us and, and uh, we'll, we'll implement them and see if we do better. Is that the way it works? That's, that's, not, not, it, that's not the way it works for me. No, my, most of my, my uh, projects come through the, the uh, developmental banks, um, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank. Um, I, I was very lucky when I was in Hong Kong that I was involved in the first law reform project that the ADB did, Asian Development Bank back in 97. Um, more recently, um, really the last, well, the last 15 years, I've been very lucky that I've had projects both at the country level and at international level. So with other co-authors, I've been able to work with the World Bank on both corporate personal insolvency projects. Uh, but the latest projects in both Bhutan and, and, uh, and Laos came through the World Bank IFC. And uh, we've had very small teams and then we work with the government to um, try to make the law better. Is it a team of lawyers or a combination? Uh, basically, they're, they're small teams, but the teams I've been working on are really teams of myself and someone from the World Bank, both lawyers. And then uh, in these countries, we generally work with uh, government officials, often from the Supreme Court. Is it one size fits all? I mean, do you find that there's a sort of common denominator, um, a bunch of rules that, that are fundamental for all mm, developing countries, or, or do you want to you sort of fit it to the specific country in some ways? How does that work? Both, both, because I, I, I'm a history major, and I like the law to have some relevance. So wherever I can, I like to, to, to base on what is there, so I'll be more familiar, rather than just starting afresh. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, if one is starting afresh, there are certain things that one could do. Um, one change that I like to make is to make the law easily readable by lawyers and non-lawyers alike. In in most of Asia right now, the huge growth in businesses, and this is true in China as well, is with small businesses, family businesses, partnerships. Most of those people have very little in the way of formal education. And the difficulty in many of these countries is the insolvency law um, is written in a language that uh, is very, very difficult for them to understand. So you wanna make the concept simple, ideally make them uh, efficient, and um, the first part that you mentioned are there are some best practices that you're shooting for, and then you're trying to best to, to get them into the country um, within the legal system that they are uh, familiar with and comfortable with. Does that mean training the judges? Uh, does that mean showing them a, a better way? The training is crucial to it. So basically drafting the law is just the first part. Um, insolvency law is very procedural. So you need secondary legislation with all the rules and regulations, setting out the timeline, setting out the requirements, a book of forms. And if anything in Laos, that's what we're doing right now. So the law has been enacted, but now the stage is coming where you talk about 
you know, what uh, should the regulations look like, what will the forms look like. And then the training is absolutely key uh, because in many of these countries, uh, judges have never handled insolvency cases. So unlike your typical uh, civil litigation where you have a plaintiff and a defendant, in insolvency, you have many parties. You, know, you have workers, you have creditors, you have you know, government officials, you have government claims. So it's so multifaceted. It's a very, very different type of proceeding. Some of these countries are going to have a fair level of historical corruption. How do you, how do you um, sort of write that out uh, with uh, either the substantive or, or procedural rules that you suggest to them? No, that, that's a problem. That, that's been a problem in, uh, in, in many countries. Um, and what you, what you have to do is try to have a separation of powers as much as you can. Um, so if, if, the, if the judge controls everything, if the judge controls the allocation of the assets, if the judge is picking all the parties, um, then that can actually lead to nepotism. Um, that actually was the case in the U.S. as well under our earlier law. So right now, the modern trend, the best principles, is that you want the judge only involved in the adjudicatory aspects of the, of the case. Um, and you want government regulation. So I think it's very helpful to have a department that also regulates the, the judges and the administrators and, and the like. A, a bigger problem that exists in, in Asia right now is that the structure for these companies is so complicated, often with offshore holding uh, basically uh, involved in the process. The Cayman Islands BVI is often where the parent company is. You then have subsidiaries. Uh, there might be one in Hong Kong, banking in Singapore, the assets in China. And with all those moving parts, um, it, it does happen that uh, if the individuals behind the company want to perpetuate a fraud, uh, then by the time the fraud is discovered, you just have a real big mess. And yeah. uh, my experience has been that you no know, insolvency law will not work very efficiently where there just is massive fraud. It, it just it makes it very, very difficult because that just uh, causes so many problems, especially in countries where you don't have strong ability for the administrators to really dig in and investigate and see what's going on. Well, do, you, do you ever get to that? I mean, do you ever say, look, uh, you know, this is just a nice system we're giving you, but you need to have oversight. You need to have um, investigators and prosecutors and the like to stamp out the fraud because otherwise the system won't work as intended. Uh, and therefore, you know, perhaps you want to look at this, that, and the other thing to build a better structure around investigation and prosecution. Correct. And that's why it's not just training of judges, it's also training of the administrators, of, of the office holders who are doing the investigation. Uh, but, but part of the difficulty, and another way of addressing this, is that most cases in Asia are not just dealing in one country. You have cross-border issues. Mm. Uh, so oftentimes, you'll see American creditors trying to get into the U.S. courts for the reason that you mentioned, or, or British creditors trying to perhaps get back to the, to, to the U.K. So a lot of these jurisdictional battles are creditors trying to get to a country where uh, they think they will be treated uh, fairly. Um, that, that being said, I, I think most Asian countries have seen a dramatic improvement in their processes. And as their experience develops with these cases, I think you do see that the systems are getting better and much more vibrant. And, and that's happened uh, really throughout uh, most, Asian, uh, most Asian countries that have a law that is being, being used. Well, that takes us to um, you know, putting it in the context of, uh, of now, mm -hmm. of current events. Um, and a, a big question, you know, here in the United States, our economy is really in tatters. Whether the government tells us accurately what's happening with it or not, it is pretty much in tatters. And it looks like we're going to have more tatters before we're done. Um, and I wonder about that in Asia. I wonder about that. You, you spoke of China, how China has taken some pretty constructive steps to avoid, uh, you know, that and to improve its, uh, its economy after the, its original experience with COVID, mm -hmm. but what about Asia in general? What about the economies of these various countries you've been dealing with? How much, how much has COVID set them back right now? Oh, it set them back a lot. It has set them back a lot. But when it comes to insolvency, every crisis is different. So if you think of the Asian financial crisis, uh, that was a crisis that hit both the banking sector and most corporate, most corporations throughout the corporate sectors. So that was just devastation everywhere. And in many Asian countries where uh, real estate trades on the stock market. Hong Kong is a good example. Everything crashed at the same time. It was just a complete mess. The Great Recession in 2008 was primarily in the banking industry because of mortgage foreclosures, and then it you know, spilled over to the U.S. auto industry. This crisis is very, very different because it's caused by a disease. So if anything, countries are trying to 
postpone the problems. And that's where all the stimulus comes in, the payments to individuals. You're trying to keep people out of bankruptcy, out of the courts, and hope that there will be a vaccine or that things will get better. So even in the states right now, through June, the number of insolvency cases, bankruptcy cases, is lower than last year. Now, it might increase in the third and fourth quarter if we don't get the next uh, batch of uh, stimulus, uh, but right now the cases are lower. Uh, when one looks at Hong Kong, the cases are up, but only up a little, not anywhere near earlier crises. Again, because what governments are doing, they're trying to put money in individuals' pockets. Uh, the banks in most countries, um, and uh, China would be a good example of this, um, are basically being authorized to lower interest rates. You're deferring payments uh, in China, they're going to do it into this, um, basically the spring of 2021. And the idea is if we can just buy time, if we can buy, get, buy time to a period when, again, a vaccine is working or the cases have gone down, then we can avoid all the problems from insolvency. So, so that makes it very, very different than earlier crises in Asia where companies were in, in, in very poor shape and wanted to use these procedures. So, so right now, we, we do not see a great take up of that. But as I said, when I, um, when I look at the data, I think it will change. And certainly when I talk to my, my friends in Hong Kong who are practicing, they say they've seen an increase in cases, not a huge number, but they've started to see a number of, uh, a number of cases uh, that, that are occurring. Well, it sounds like uh, there's a lot of forbearance going on. For, for example, here, uh, Hawaiian Electric has said, we're, we're not going to terminate your service, even if you don't pay us. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that like in December. Uh, and there's a lot of banks, are not, they're not pushing, they're, they're forbearing, and this is very healthy and good and kind and humane and everything. But there comes a tipping point where, you know, Hawaiian Electric needs to de develop right. revenue. Uh, the banks need to satisfy the bank examiners and so forth. And I think the tipping point comes at a certain point where um, they can't forbear anymore for whatever reasons. And the, and the inability to forbear will come uh, at, at, at a certain point to multiple organizations which have been forbearing until then. In other words, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's connected. And, and finally, um, it seems to me that uh, when that happens, the bankruptcy court is going to be filled up because somebody who can't pay his bills now doesn't have a big problem. He doesn't need to rely on the protection of the, of the insolvency and bankruptcy laws because nobody's pushing him. When they start pushing him, it's going to be different here and there and everywhere. So how do you find that point? Where does that inflection come, come, come at S? Well, I think what you've described is, is the way things would work in the states. So I think right now things have held back. Um, if the stimulus does not come, at a certain point, yes, people are going to be evicted by the, by, by the banks. There's going to be problems. There's going to be insolvencies, and the courts will handle it. Um, it throughout Asia, it, it's somewhat different. Um, and one reason is many Asian countries do not have a personal bankruptcy law. The, the laws are just for business. So the issues that you describe with the individuals, they're handled, but they're generally not handled under the insolvency law. Mm. Um, basically, when we uh, worked on the law for Laos, we, we tried having individuals involved, but it was only through the business capacity. Um, they were not yet at the stage where they wanted a law for individuals uh, generally. Uh, but you are absolutely right that if the individuals do have access to it and things get bad, they will use it. And, and Hong Kong is a great example of that because they went from a system, and this is back, back to the Asian financial crisis, where you literally had a few hundred cases a year where individuals filed and there was a disincentive to file because it's very hard to get a discharge to get on with your life. Uh, but once they came up with the discharge, within a few years, you literally went from a few hundred cases to 25,000. Wow. So, so if you do have a law that works very, very well on the personal side, you'll see a huge increase. However, on the corporate side, that, that's not the case. Even if you look at the data, um, even when countries enact laws and they're much better, uh, in, during the Asian financial crisis, Japan was the only country where you saw a dramatic increase at first. And more recently with China, um, their law came into a, effect, I said, about 13 years ago. And it took a decade before the number of cases really got to a level that equaled what they had before. And now that they're at that level and they have the judge and they have the capacity, then you see the cases start increasing. But you really can't get that system until you have the institutional capacity to handle the cases. And most Asian countries right now do not have the institutional capacity for dealing with lots and lots of cases. So it's still you no know, very few compared to what we would see um, here. Let's, uh, let's, let's drill down on Hong Kong, because mm -hmm. yeah, Hong Kong is in a, right. a special situation for, well, primarily because of China doing what it's doing. Um, but Hong Kong has, has COVID. 
Um, it, it, people are not nearly as productive as they were. Um, China is making it harder and harder. Although my understanding is it's not doing that to business. It's not doing that to the banks. It's just doing that to the guy literally on the street. And I wonder where all of this takes us for Hong Kong. Um, if they get cut off from you know, the world funding mechanisms, which they may, uh, then Hong Kong is going to be history. It's going to be swept into uh, becoming a city in China, all repressed and everything. So where are we then now with insolvency uh, and with the economy of Hong Kong and with the effect of the national security law that's, that's crushing free speech there? Oh, 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 Hong Kong is in, in a very bad place right now. There, there's no doubt about it. Um, I, I was in Hong Kong um, three times over the last um, six, seven months. I was there during the, the student protests. I, I, I saw that. Um, and even before uh, you know, the, the recent uh, developments in Hong Kong, both with uh, the pandemic and with the national security law, they already had huge issues. Uh, but, but Hong Kong is very adaptable and, and very flexible. And I, I think there's a few reasons not to write off Hong Kong so quickly as a, as a financial center. Um, one of them is that the infrastructure is all there. And uh, people talk about Hong Kong just becoming another Chinese city, uh, but right now it's not just another Chinese city. And, and Shenzhen and, and Shanghai um, are, are years away be, before they could perhaps replace Hong Kong. And, and even if they rose to that level, the, 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 Hong, Hong Kong runs differently than those cities do. Now, now that being said, um, the, the difficulties you have now um, are problematic. And, and if, the, if the Hong Kong banks get cut off from the international banking system, well, well that's, that's a very different uh, problem. And that, that, would, that, would be, that would be devastating. Uh, but I don't think that's going to happen. I, I, think, I, I hope that doesn't happen. But at this point, um, we need individuals and politicians and governments to proceed cautiously and try to find a path forward here. Um, when it comes to trade, um, that one... We can we hopefully we'll talk about on Friday, you know, with with WTO and and, and China's uh, and, and Hong Kong's claim that they're they're going to proceed. They want to maybe have a claim against the states, um, because on, on the trade issue, uh, one is going to be looking at whether or not Hong Kong is now independent. You know, do your customs officials in Hong Kong are they able to exercise independence of judgment and what happens? Because that affects a lot of issues. So so on on the trade issues, I think there are there are problems. Um, when it comes to professional services. Um, Hong Kong and Singapore are still the two best places in Asia, and it's people oriented. And again, for for the for the near future, that that is a huge advantage. And the Hong Kong lawyers um, have always done a very very good job of being able to to adapt against the backdrop of um, legal system that is changing very slowly. Uh, because right now it is very difficult to get laws enacted in Hong Kong, but but that's been the case for a long time. Um, I, ironically. Um, Right now, Hong Kong is again proposing a new corporate rescue law. Uh, I started studying that back in the 1990s, and they're coming up to the 25th anniversary of the first time they proposed it, and they still have not enacted it. So what's, a lot, a res what's a rescue law? Like a, basically Chapter 11, a, a, oh, basically okay, okay. A, a, corporate, uh, a formal corporate rescue law, uh, we would call it. So one cannot blame China for the problems of Hong Kong not enacting legislation. This has been a huge problem in Hong Kong um, for the last few decades. And it's been exacerbated by what's happening now. Uh, but it is not just something that is new. And, and against that backdrop, the, the courts have shown flexibility and the lawyers have as well. So to the extent that the Hong Kong courts uh, lose uh, their creativity um, and ingenuity, then you, you certainly could have some, um, some difficulties. Uh, but with a lot of these cases, uh, given, again, that offshore holding company structure I mentioned to you, th there's other options. So that work will go elsewhere. Maybe it'll go to Singapore. So, so even, even right now, a lot of the, the, the Hong Kong law firms, you know, there's, they have lawyers who are qualified in Singapore, and, and they can actually you know, move those people to Singapore or have that work done elsewhere. So things will, will, will change as the uh, situation develops. Yeah, well, flexibility. And uh, that, that, that means that Hong Kong may lose some of its uh, special, special sauce but let me, let me ask you this, and this is it's a hard question to ask with only a few minutes left to talk about it. <clears throat> so there's a triangular thing happening. There's Hong Kong, of course, there's China. We're pushing all the buttons these days, not only in Hong Kong, but, you know, in this morning's paper in India, in the, the, the Galwan Pass, uh, in the Himalayas, uh, in, in Mongolia recently. Uh, and they've been really mean to Tibet. 
Um, and of course, they're, they have aspirations on Taiwan and, and the South China Sea, all that stuff, all that aggressive geopolitical things they want. Uh, and then the US, which is in a sort of mm, upside down position right now uh, in terms of foreign policy uh, you know, toward Asia in general. So mm, this is pretty complicated now. And I guess I'll, I'll shave the question down to ask you, what, what do you think the US ought to do for its own interests um, to preserve Hong Kong, to preserve a robust uh, sort of healthy relationship, if we can get back to that with China? Well, first of all, I think you've just made the perfect introduction to why people should tune in on uh, on Friday. Absolutely. Listen, it's very, very tricky time right now with everything. Uh, my own approach is to proceed much more multilaterally and come up with a coherent policy that is discussed with allies and that you are discussing in a way that does not uh, pour kerosene on the fire. I think what we've seen too much lately are individual statements uh, that, that are made at a, at, a, at a press conference, at a briefing, and no one knows if it's an official statement or, or what's happening. And we don't seem to have a, a coherent policy uh, that, is, that is being developed in, in an organized fashion. So I think that would be absolutely huge. Um, secondly, I think one has to bring the tensions down a bit. And, and thirdly, um, even with the situation in Hong Kong, there's ways of proceeding that rather than just announcing things, you can go through proper channels. You know, if, if you think that there has been a change in status, then, then, then proceed accordingly, um, but, but just don't, uh, don't rush into things. So, so I think that the, the US needs to, needs to be strong, but also needs to, to work with its allies and uh, try to take the situation forward in, in, a, in, a, in a better manner. Well, uh, one last thing, and that is pretty much about Hong Kong. Is this, is this a good time uh, for me and my friends to go to Hong Kong? <clears throat> Forgetting about the travel restrictions for a moment. Uh, economically, is this a good time? Academically, in terms of free speech and safety under the national security law, uh, is this a good time for me to go there or should I avoid it? No, well, first of all, as you said, we can't go because we're going to be quarantined when you go there. And then since you're in Hawaii, you're going to be quarantined when you come back. So <laughs> you've got to set aside a month before you even step <laughs> Um, when it comes to personal safety, Hong Kong is very, very safe um, as, 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 a place to, as a place to go. Um, when it comes with, uh, on, the, on the political front, one has to be careful, especially not a tourist, not as much a, a, as permanent residents, uh, but one has to, to sort of be, be careful to, to navigate it. Uh, but, but for myself, you know, but for the, the, the restrictions because of the pandemic, I, I, I would head over there. Um, I, I, I love Hong Kong and I'd like to see what's happening sort of, you know, on the street myself. And, yeah, and you spent uh, and academic years there. Hawaii. During pandemics, yes, you, you, it is a very nice time to go because there's these few tours there and things are, are less expensive. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Charlie, thank you so much for thank joining you. me this morning. Uh, we'll, we'll see you and we'll discuss these things in greater detail um, on a Friday morning at uh, 10 o'clock on the webinar. People can sign up um, to hear you and the other three panelists, all academicians from various places. Uh, on thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, it's great to see you. Great to I see look you. forward to our further discussions. Thank you. See you on Friday. See you on Friday. Bye-bye.